here today during um, my prep. I'll get it posted for you guys, as well as this one, so then you have it, okay? We left off on Friday talking about immigration and into the United States and how that largely kind of begins to shape and uh, the uh, look of the United States, but as well as how it shapes our second industrial revolution, and it is that labor force that allows for that. So if we look at this uh, population and labor force, and I apologize if that's a little bit difficult to read, but basically what we can see is that the U.S. will always go through these population shifts where we will go from having a more um, urban environment to a more rural environment to a more urban environment to a more rural environment. Today we are currently in a shift away from the rural environment and more towards urban environments. Does that make sense? Largely, this is dictated by a couple of things. One, the availability of land and desirability of land. The other thing that it largely will shift this then as well is uh, industrialization and the availability of jobs in the cities, right? So it's either can you make more money as a farmer or can you make more money living working in a factory? Which one is going to be better for you? Now, there are some other factors that will create some of these shifts. So, for example... Post-World War II, we see white flight or white Americans moving out of the cities and into suburbia, right? And so now we're seeing white Americans move back into the cities because it's a cool place to live, right? In the heart of downtown, that's where everybody wants to be. Okay, that's where all the cool kids are. But So we see these like ebbs and flows and shifts in population throughout the United States history. In 1870, about 40 million population in the United States, 75% lives in rural areas. But by 1900, that population has almost doubled to 76 million and approximately only 60% live in rural areas. So we are definitely in the path towards moving more towards um, living in the cities. And as more people live in the cities, there's numerous reasons why. The largest reason is because as we become much more mechanized on the farms, there's no reason for to have these large like families or large groups farming. You can farm with mint much fewer numbers. Um, and so it looks and forces lar many farmers to look for jobs elsewhere. Um, but what also begins to occur is we are going to start to see more people that are working in more professional style roles as we move through this time. So we're going to see more people entering into managerial roles in factories, and we are going to see more people um, bettering themselves through education and moving into more positions as lawyers and doctors and um, teachers, professors, etc. Does that make sense? And so we're going to see more of these educational driven jobs through this and through finance, et cetera. Does that make sense? As we move forward in time. As we continue, if this map were to, or this chart were to continue out this way, you are going to continue to see this number grow while you are going to see these two numbers continue to decline. Does that make sense? Okay. So if we were to fast forward through this to 2000, or even if we were to say to 2010, what do you think our numbers would look like? That marker sucks. 60% educated. I don't want to whack somebody in the head. Okay, 60% educated. <laughs> so you would think it would be at like 60%? Or do you think it would be more? So people that have two-year, like, skill traits, does that make sense, are going to fall into the middle one. So even if this is at 60%, you're probably going to see this one down maybe at, I don't know, maybe at 20%. And this one is probably only at a mere, that's 90%. So that's probably, I don't know, I would say 20 to 30% in here, maybe 10 to 20% in here. Does that make sense? Okay, with some numbers varying. But this definitely today is going to be your highest percentage. Like fast food and stuff. Fast food is going to be in here, or potentially we even create our, a new category in here like of, like, labor, but low-skill labor. I feel like there's too many in the skill. Yeah. I would agree. 
Yes, this is based. This is based on uh, historical statistics, but it's that's a book, but it comes from census data, yeah, studying of census, census data. In 2020. 2020. Yeah, so we're right around the corner of a next, another census that would give us accurate data for this. Does that make sense? Okay, you can look at the 2010 census, but and you'd have to look that up. I don't know those exact numbers. Um, well, it depends if you're a head of household. Does that make sense? So odds are what will happen um, is your parents will probably be filling out that data and including you in their census data that they fill out. Oh, yeah. Okay? Um, so just so, so that you know. Um, and some of it is they, they look for a lot of pieces of information today that they used to not necessarily seek some of that information from. So not only do they have the census, traditional census data, like a survey data, but they also utilize um, data from driver's license, data from voting, all sorts of other data. Does that make sense to compile that information? Okay. All right, so our immigrant labor con largely concentrated um, working on railroads, in industrial factories, etc. cetera. Um, they average uh, were paid much less than um, the uh, natives, American natives or people who were born here. And often because of that, then it meant that women and children had to work as well. But because they weren't the breadwinners, they were paid less than men were. In fact, generally speaking, they were paid about two-thirds of the salary that a man was. Um, which, if the man is actually there as the breadwinner and is actually there working, that might work okay if she is a second income, but that was not always the case. Uh, most families required two to three workers just to get by, and approximately 20% of all Americans lived in poverty. Um, essential things such as fossil fuels would be... Um, uh, are, were used up pretty quickly um, and made it very difficult for people to survive. Most oftentimes living in the city meant you lived in very crowded environments that often were ripe with uh, not only poverty but were also ripe with disease and other loveliness. Okay? Typically, most American families um, living in poverty would live in environments such as this in large cities, um, so very, very crowded neighborhoods. And most families, additionally, would take on what was called peace work. In other words, they would work all day outside of the household in the factory, and then they would come into the family home and do work um, that was extra additional work. Um, in listening to NPR this morning, yes, I am one of those people that listens to NPR on my way into work home from work. That's how I get my news. I find it entertaining and interesting, especially shows like, wait, wait, don't tell me. That's really funny. Okay, anyways. Okay, um, but listening to statistics as they were talking, coming in today, they were talking about how the average American, um, approximately, I think they said, if I remember correctly, like 30% of all American households do some sort of additional work outside of their 40 hour or work their regular job. So they go home and they then maybe they drive for Uber or they drive or taxi or they do Lyft or they um, do some sort of a craft or like they're selling like Mary Kay or LuLaRoe or something like that on top of what they already do on their everyday labor jobs. And this was very much true of the laborers in the United States in the early 1900s as well. Um, most families would take on work to fix and repair clothing by more wealthy individuals, and that's the most common piece work um, that was done. Here in this particular tenement, which was often where uh, most uh, of the immigrant poor lived in these tenement houses, which we will talk about um, in another chapter. This book sets things up a little bit weird. Um, but these tenement houses were literally like built one on top of the other, um, and they crowded them in as tightly as they possibly could. But the tenements also were pretty small, but because of rent prices and because of demand for housing, rent often was too high for an individual family to afford to live in a home by themselves. Um, most often your tenement home uh, was about the same, or would be smaller than this classroom. Um, so if you can imagine living in an entire, your whole family living in a space that is this large. Um, in addition to that, they often would rent out space in their houses, in their apartments, in their tenement, 
to additional males who were single to live within their apartment. And so any space that they could provide for them, they would. Sometimes if they had the availability of doors, they would actually take off the doors in the evening, stretch them across two chairs to create a bed for somebody to lay on and a space for somebody to sleep. Um, within this household, you can clearly see that this is a family in which uh, not only bringing on additional outside workers was necessary, but um, that the children are working as well. You see within this image, there is one, two, three adult males in here. Here is what appears to be like a teenage female, and there's two additional children here. Um, whether they're male children or female, we don't know. Yes, this is a child. Why is it so blurry? Because they moved, and camera technology at the time, you had to hold very, very still in order for them to actually take a photo that wasn't like blurry. Okay. Um, you also notice that this family appears to be a little bit, although not doing great for themselves, doing a little bit better because they actually have a dog. But it's not like your dogs live the like, lap of the, like, little, the life of luxury like they do today. Okay. They're eating scraps, getting by and whatever they can. But because of the immigrant laborers and because by 1900, two-thirds of Americans were working for a wage, working conditions was absolutely horrible. Um, wages and uh, the demand of laborers constantly was driving the price that, we, uh, that these laborers could get down. Um, as the number of increased immigrants increased, it also made it much more difficult to find a job. David Rico called this the iron law of wages, in which he argues that as long as there is a labor force, it doesn't demand, matter what you are willing to pay your workers, somebody will do the work, even if you are only going to pay very, very low, low wages. Um, but as the wages continued to decline and working population continued to increase, the cycle of misery and starvation only continues. And so as a result of that, by 1890, 11 million out of the 1.5, sorry, oh, my brain and mouth are not working together today. 11 million of the 12.5 million Americans earned less than $380 per year. Okay. They had very minimal resources at which to uh, seek additional help or try to change those uh, working conditions, and often the workers were just simply deemed as expendable. And so as a result of that, we will see the beginning of the creation of unions within the United States. Um, most of the time, anytime these unions, especially early on, would go on strike, the employers simply would call in scabs or workers to replace them that were easily um, put in place. The government also largely ruled in favor of corporations and would even at, at times call in our federal troops to put down and end labor unrest. Government or companies could also utilize lockouts in which they would just simply close up the doors and prevent the workers from coming in. Um, the workers were often hurt much more by the lockout than by the company because the company, the guy who owns it, has enough money in his pocket that he can go days, weeks, even months with his company not operating, but the laborers could only go merely days. Um, and often because of that, they would force their employees to sign ironclad oaths and also create what they called yellow dog contracts, which, meant that, which made it so that unions within a particular um, uh, business were pretty much outlawed. Um, individuals who tried often to join unions were sometimes blacklisted. And because the, the, the problem gets to be is, when you worked for a particular company, like say you worked for Henry Ford, you lived in Henry Ford's plant town, which meant your grocery store that you had to buy all your food at was run by Henry Ford, and your housing was owned by Henry Ford, and your children went to schools that were operated by Henry Ford. So if you quit your job, it wasn't just like, oh, I'm going to quit my job. You quit your job and you lose your housing, and you lose access to food, and you literally lose access to everything. In fact, there were some employers who would literally pay their workers not in actual money, but in money that could only be spent in company stores. So there was no way for you to really get outside of that 
you are held to that company. So it becomes increasingly difficult for um, individuals early on to kind of rally and create these unions. But on, what we see begin in um, 1866 is we'll start to see the creation of labor unions as a whole, okay? Um, the NLU is, large, is the first of the labor unions, and it basically was the first attempt to get everybody and all workers to work together. It allowed every worker, male, female, skilled, unskilled farmers, however, it does exclude the Chinese laborers. They would push for kind of bread and butter type items like cooperatives. Cooperatives like electrical cooperatives allow for individuals to own a stake within the electrical company and then thus able to bring the prices of that commodity down. Um, they also would push for an eight hour workday, which is basically their biggest victory. Um, and at its height, we'll have about approximately 700,000 uh, members. However, uh, they kind of begin to fade by the wayside, uh, largely just because of a lack of organization and also because of the creation of the Knights of Labor. The other thing that really kills the National Labor Union is there's a depression in 1873, and quite frankly, that meant that most of the workers needed some sort of job. It didn't really matter what that job was and what the pay was, and so they were willing to work without actually having the union itself. There were others that used uh, intimidation and violence. In particular, in 1875, a group called the Molly Maguires is founded in the Irish coal mines in Pennsylvania. They will use intimidation and violence, um, and ultimately the railroad company will call the Pinkertons in to uh, put down the strike led by the Molly Maguires, and, with, and at the end of that strike, there are 20 members of the Molly Maguires that are hung by the Pinkertons. Um, not nearly as radical as some of the others, the Knights of Labor, founded in 1881 by Terence Powderly, will once again accept all workers except the Chinese. You notice a trend here, right? The, that anti-Asian -im immigrant is pretty strong. The Knights of Labor is actually founded from a couple of different organizations. The Secret Society of the Holy and Noble Order of the Knights of Labor is their full name. Um, and but the problem with the Knights of Labor is by the 1880s, they again had huge numbers and their numbers were so large, it was actually, and two, they were so spread out across the United States that it was too hard for them to actually control those workers and to ensure that there was a greater um, organization amongst the individuals. And ultimately it is the Haymarket riot that will cause their downfall. We'll talk about that here momentarily. The last is the American Federation of Labor, led by Samuel Gompers. I love Samuel Gompers just because I love his name. I think Gompers, I don't know, I just I like the way it sounds, okay? Um, but it is founded also in 1881. Um, the difference there is they created two separate unions for the skilled laborers and the unskilled laborers. They specifically wanted to work within the system um, and work for political change, um, although they do not, unlike the other two organizations, form a political party. So they want to work through the system, but do so without actually creating a political organization of their own. Um, over one million workers will join the uh, American Federation of Labor. And they largely work for what we call the bread and butter issues, things like higher wages, better working conditions, uh, eight hour work day, et cetera, okay? Um, the American Federation of Labor is one of the few labor unions that is grown out of this time and still exists today. Um, although today it is merged with another, um, it is called the Congress of Industrial Organizations. So if you ever see the CIO, uh, a F L. That's those two guys. Does that make sense? Okay, and you might hear that or see that on the news on occasion. Does that make sense? Okay, it today is the largest uh, uh, largest organization 
or labor union in the United States, one of them anyways, okay? Employers, quite frankly, hated, hated and feared unions, um, and so they did what they could to uh, break them apart. They saw them as anarchist and un-American. We can see this very clearly in the um, arguments of numerous uh, industrialists, but we can also see the argument in for, for it as well. Reverend Henry Ward Beecher, um, who was a distinguished clergyman and active abolitionist, said that the trade union, which was organized under the European dis system, destroys liberty. So he did not believe in the unions whatsoever at all. He said, I did not say that a dollar a day is enough to support a working man, but it is enough to support a man. Not enough to support a man and five children if the man insists on smoking and drinking beer. So in other words, if the guy wants to make more money, he should just be better about how he spends his money, and therefore he would be okay with that amount of money. There were other groups that were much, much more radical. In fact, we will see the rise of the American Socialist Party led by Eugene Debs in this time. Debs believed that we needed to overthrow the laissez-faire and capitalist system that existed within the United States and that the only way our government could ever continue to truly function was if the government set controls for wages and prices and distribution of goods. Okay? He argued that there could be no profit nor competition and that uh, these things would ultimately make our system better because it would level the playing field across the board. Debs will run for president three times. Yes, that is three times. The most votes Debs will ever get is actually when he is in jail for violating the Espionage and Sedition Act during the course of World War I, in which he will see, receive one million votes while sitting in jail. But that's the most votes he ever gets. He only got like, like and that isn't even like 15%. So, you know, he didn't get, that's a popular, one million popular vote. But, um, but he will try for that. But he believed in that government ownership. Um, it is Debs ultimately then as well who will form the Great Railroad um, Union and will organize railroad workers to join together. Um, in 1877, or in 1873 actually, initiates one of the, to this point, worst financial economic depressions in the United States, and that has been continuing into the late 1870s. And in, during this economic depression, many companies had cut wages and continually had cut wages, cut wages, cut wages, cut wages, in particular for the railroad workers. And so in 1877, the railroad workers, starting in Boston, began to demand uh, that their wages were increased now that the depression was coming to an end. Um, the strikes that started in Baltimore ultimately was spread across the United States until approximately two-thirds of all railroads in the United States were shut down. They would be joined by an additional 500,000 500, workers, um, and the strikes would continually escalate. The problem was is the Great Railroad Strike was very bad for the United States government. Okay? Remember, our railroads at the time were utilized for all sorts of purposes, not only to move U.S. mail, very quickly across the United States, but it was also utilized to be able to move troops throughout the United States. And remember, it is 1877. So although we are done talking about the Indian Wars, it is 1877, so we are still in the midst of the Plains Indian Wars. Does that make sense, guys? So we need to be able to have those trains to be able to move troops to where they need to go for that purpose. In addition to that, we need those railroads functioning so we can make our industries work and make our factory system work. Without the raw products coming from the West, it is impossible for our industrial system to work on the East Coast. And so as a result, the federal government will come in, uh, led by or sent in by um, President Hayes, the federal troops are brought in to bring down the strike. The strike turns violent, and in the end, 100 people died. Um, and although wages and working conditions improve over time for the railroad workers, it also shows the railroad workers and others that the federal government would be willing to bring in the uh, military and 
basically in support of big business rather than support of the American public. Um, this becomes the norm until Theodore Roosevelt actually will change that, uh, and he will actually utilize the federal government to, uh, in support of the worker. But that's not for quite some time yet. As a result of the decline of the American, uh, we see, or I'm sorry, as a result of this, um, largely we see uh, the federal government take a pretty hard line against unions, and that only gives Debs even greater, like, uh, rallying cry and force to help create a larger union. And he really works to replace all the little smaller unions with the American Railway Union, uh, bringing together those workers, skilled and unskilled, and uniting all of them. In the context of this strike, we'll also see other strikes spur throughout the United States. One of the worst strikes that will occur is as a result of the Harry Market Riot. In May 3rd of 1860, or I'm sorry, 1886, Joining a nationwide strike, um, the Chicago workers at the McCormick Reaper plant uh, decide to go on strike. Oh, I'm really sorry that it's kind of difficult to read. If I turn off another light, it makes it make it easier. Yeah, okay. Um, so basically, they went on strike to demand an eight-hour workday. Now, to us, this is pretty much the norm. But in, in today's world, if we go on strike, um, or if we work a day, right, if we work more than eight hours in that day, what happens? You get overtime. You're also guaranteed in your work day, if you work um, eight hours, you are guaranteed two 15-minute breaks as well as a 30-minute uninterrupted break. Does that make sense? You're guaranteed basically an hour off during that eight-hour day. We will come back with that tomorrow. Okay.